Thank you. Uh, first of all, on behalf of the organizers, we are honored that Professor Michal Dimitri accepted our invitation. And I'm sure that we can all agree that he's more than a mentor and a model to us. And his contribution to analytic philosophy and logic are widely recognized. Therefore, uh, we invite you to celebrate the World Logic Day uh, with the, the conference we consider to be the highlight of Aleph for this semester. So Professor Michal Dimitri, I suppose that uh, we uh, have one, uh, one uh, and something 15 minutes uh, for the talk, and then we are going to the Q and A part. Thank you very much, Paula, and uh, thank you all for having me. <clears throat> I'm very pleased, very happy to be with friends and to talk uh, about philosophy on logic and logic on this very special occasion. Uh, this very day in which we celebrate. Uh, uh, worldwide uh, logic. We celebrate uh, uh, Tarski and Gödel, uh, mostly because when they decided to set uh, the day of the 14th of January as the World Logic Day, they had in mind the birthday of Tarski, I guess, and uh, the day when uh, Gödel passed away, if I'm not wrong. It might be the other way around, but for sure it was the birthday of one of them and the uh, <clears throat> day of the passing away of the other. Uh, so, um, this uh, evening uh, I'm prepared to talk for roughly 70-75 minutes on this uh, topic. I'd like to give you some um, uh, elements for an answer to the question in a logic for fictionalism. And uh, the topic that I'm going to focus upon is this uh, title of my presentation on failed reference meaningful discourse. Could you, could you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, we can. I can hear some uh, some noise from the environment. Maybe someone is having the mic uh, open and uh, uh, I can hear what the sounds in, in that room. Okay. I don't know. Okay, so um, here we go. Um, the, someone said okay. Yeah. Okay, so uh, the, the problem of uh, empty or uh, non uh, referring names, uh, that is, names that lack a referent, even though they feature in apparently meaningful discourse, continues uh, to be one of uh, the most hotly debated problems in philosophy of language and metaphysics nowadays. Following uh, the explosion, as it were, of work that attended Kripke's arguments for a direct reference amount of names, there is now something approaching orthodoxy about the semantic contribution that uh, names make to propositions and the uh, truth conditions of propositions. This uh, orthodoxy nowadays, uh, quite to be, to be quite very honest, an uh, uneasy orthodoxy whose uh, core support is found in the US mainly is uh, Millianism. According to Millianism, we uh, know all very well, what names and other directly referential expressions semantically contribute to propositions are their reference, nothing more and nothing less. Sentences that contain names express structure propositions, often called singular or Rassilian propositions that embody such reference as constituents. Softer versions of Millianism allow that names contribute something more as well, say a mode of presentation. But of course, the problem of empty names is troubling for millions of any kind, soft or hard, since millions appear committed to the view that empty names are unable to make a semantic contribution so that sentences containing empty names fail to say anything, let alone anything true. Again, truth to be told in reference and existence, uh, 
Kripke's John Locke Lectures, which eventually got published some seven years ago. Uh, so in this monograph, Kripke emphasizes the point that pretense or make-believe discourse does not prove anything for or against any theory of naming. In particular, it does not require necessarily a Frege Russell type of account for naming. <clears throat> there is uh, now a lively industry devoted to finding millions friendly solutions to this quandary. Some uh, millions insist on distinguishing, distinguishing what is expressed and what is implicated. Uh, distinction uh, welded in support of the view that what we see as meaningful and even true expressed. Others appeal to gappy propositions, proposition like entities expressed by sentences containing empty names that can fail to be true because of the gaps and become true when negated. But those solutions have well-documented problems. And that might suggest the wisdom of a return to some version of descriptivism. And indeed, neo-descriptivism has had a minor resurgence in some parts of the world. But neo-descriptivist accounts of names have their own familiar suite of problems and are anathema to many. In short, while the problem of empty names continues to be a thorn in the side of millionism, millionism continues to survive and even thrive. Now, <clears throat> to come closer to the main topic of my discussion this evening. In uh, this monograph, Reference Without Reference, RWR, Mark Sainsbury takes a very different approach. And his avowed aim is to describe a picture of reference. Names like Hamlet or Vulcan or Sherlock Holmes are indeed empty. That sentences containing such names are entirely intelligible, at least some of them, and that many such sentences, like for instance, Vulcan does not exist. Or many children believe that Santa Claus will give them presents at Christmas and so on and so forth are literally true. Sainsbury again makes it clear that he thought in uh, Miliani's idea of singular and general structure propositions that form the content of sentences. But nevertheless, he thinks that a return to descriptivism is not viable. And uh, the present, in the present talk, I am going to give, to give a brief account of Sainsbury alternative approach to these issues before presenting some problems. Of course, the upshot is to discuss some aspects of fictionalism and to see whether or not we can capture those intuitions using some types of free logics. So, especially for those of you who do not know the framework of RWR, let me give you a bit of background. Now, <clears throat> the Alternative that Sainsbury favors combines the following two fundamental ideas. There is, to begin with, his endorsement of the Davidsonian program in the theory of meaning, filtered through McDowell's interpretation. And this is accompanied by a commitment to negative free logic, NFL, which he takes it to be the most appropriate logical tool for coping with semantic problems in natural language. In short, Sainsbury's approach, RWR, is Davidsonian true theoretic semantics plus negative free logic. Now, prima facie, it may seem odd that in developing RWR, Sainsbury 
should embrace a Davidsonian position. After all, the main issue here is that of reference or lack of it all. And it is well known that Davidson's attitude toward the role that reference plays when it comes to explaining the relation between language and reality is one of downsizing as it were. For Donald Davidson, reference is a derived rather than a primitive relation. Sainsbury gives his own reasons for being dissatisfied with this aspect of Davidson's view, but I'm not going to go into that part <clears throat> which is rather technical and it's not the main line of my argument. So the framework for RWR is configured by truth theoretic semantics plus NFL. An important part of the motivation for supporting such a combination is that they will secure for Sainsbury what he is looking for, namely, a semantic position which eventually avoids the Fregan million polarity that defines the current orthodoxy in the semantics of natural language. And uh, incidentally, Kit Fine semantic relationism, which was out after RWR, is also a program which motivated, which is motivated by the very idea of solving this kind of polarity. Uh, which seems that we got stuck with, but is something that cannot account for our semantic intuitions. So maybe a sort of synthesis between those two extreme positions, Fregans or Millians, is the one that we have to look for. So coming back to RWR, what is the specific contribution that each theoretic assumption makes to the story that Sainsbury is telling? Now, Let's begin with Sainsbury's Davidsonianism. The program of truth theoretic semantics for natural languages initiated through the classic paper, Truth and Meaning, 1967, is one of the two very important programs that Davidson founded in the field of the theory of meaning. Davidson's profound idea was that the Tarski style axiomatic truth theory language can serve as a compositional theory of meaning for the same language. To be adequate, such a finitely axiomatizable truth theory, free sentence, let's call it small s, of the object language, a biconditional uh, T theorem of the form S is true if and only if P, where S is a name or structural description of an object language sentence, and P stands for a meta language sentence that gives the condition under which the sentence S is true. So mind the fact that uh, according to Tarski, what are true or false are sentences and not propositions. Now, they Davidson thinks that a theory of this kind shows how we form and understand complex expressions on the basis of our understanding of the constituent primitive expressions and of the rules of combination, the syntax. Uh, in agreeing with this fundamental approach, Sainsbury sides with Davidson and against a tradition which identifies meanings with special entities that can be grasped in our understanding. And Davidson famously says that meanings as entities, quote unquote, have no demonstrative use in a theory of meaning. And this applies no less to model theoretic approaches to meanings for what is distinctive in such approaches is the spelling out of meanings in terms of semantic values. Given uh, his belief in the intelligibility of sentences containing empty names, such as for instance, Vulcan does not exist, it is scarcely surprising that Sainsbury should prefer a Davisonian position, which that does not make much use of the concept of reference. Model theory is not fit to treat the meaningful contribution of referring expressions that actually refer to nothing, and so can have no semantic value in themselves. 
And Davidson's position, by contrast, can be adapted to deal with the intelligibility of such expressions. Now here in condensed form is Sainsbury's main idea. I quote from RWR page 53. I suggest that we should see axioms for referring expressions in the same way. These expressions are associated with a reference condition which may or may not be satisfied, just as a sentence is associated with a truth condition which may or may not be satisfied. Roughly speaking, in model theory, meanings are entities, whereas in truth theory, Davidson style, they are conditions. So on Sainsbury implementation of this suggestion, the meaning specification can be done by the subsidiary clauses of a Davidsonian truth theory with compositional rules generating ideally homophonic truth conditions of entire sentences. And the subsidiary clauses for names are given in the form, and you have it here on the slide, pick every X, A refer refers to X, if and only if X is identical to A. Where, the, where language users who have been initiated into the practice of using the name A are presumed to know enough to understand the condition of reference, it is identical to A, whether or not A has a referent. And they can be given in the form A refers to A, since Sainsbury preferred logic NFL counts any instance in which A is an empty referring expression as false. Now this can sound close to descriptivism, but here Sainsbury endorses an important theme from McDowell. Names can very well have senses in Sainsbury's terms associated reference conditions, despite these lacking descriptive content. Sainsbury takes the senses, references, conditions for names to be both non-descriptive and at the same time singular in what they purport to pick out. And he thinks this allows names to retain some of the important features millions claim for them, in particular rigidity. Now, names are not the only potentially non-referring referring expression. This is not a contradiction in, uh, in terms because what he takes and what I understand by his uh, uh, term non-referring referring expression is the fact that the expression has a referential form like a name, but that name does not actually refer. And this is why we get this non-referring referring expressions. So actually non-referring, but by the form of the expression, the expression is referring, like for instance, Hamlet or Sherlock Holmes. So again, names are not the only potentially non-referring referring expression that can be ascribed the meaning in a way that meshes with such an extended Davidsonian approach. Sainsbury extends this account to pronouns and consider the following brief example of how he handles empty demonstratives. In the case of someone who wrongly thinks that there is a little green man in her field of view and others, that little green man is bold. We can ascribe content to her utterance by describing what she says in a certain canonical scene content way. Conditionalizing on the scene, we can say hallucinating. Okay, so conditionalizing on the scene, we can say hallucinating a little green man. Her utterance was true if and only if he was bold. And this gives a conditional truth condition, or more simply, hallucinating a little green man, she said that he was bold. Now, Sainsbury thinks that RWR, unlike millionism, has no trouble accommodating such failed thoughts. And here is again a quote from RWR. There are 
as many singular thoughts on the present view as on a million view. But on this view, unlike millionism, a failed singular thought or utterance can be a genuine thought or an utterance which succeeds in saying something. These have, if not truth conditions, at least conditional truth conditions and can be reported in the standard sin content way. But now, <clears throat> In failing to refer to reality, can failed thoughts and utterances feature a truth-oriented discourse, including arguments? This brings us to the foundational part of RWR, concerned with the logical principles that govern a language containing non-referring referring expressions. And what RWR needs is a kind of logic that will allow in contradistinction to classical first order logic with identity, expressions deemed intuitively intelligible, even if they lack reference in their domain of interpretation. <clears throat> it is not surprising at all then that Sainsbury adopts a free logic as his standard logic, where a general system LF is a free logic if and only if LF is free of existential presuppositions with respect to both the singular and general terms of the language of LF. And the quantifiers of LF are the standard quantifiers whose variables of quantification ranging over existing things and nothing else. And of course, the issue is what kind of free logic and why. <clears throat> now, uh, long before, uh, Sainsbury and all the others started this kind of discussion. In uh, Saul Kripke's John Locke lectures, 1973, which are, were actually delivered at around the same time when free logicians started to develop their own trade. So Kripke had this genius intuition and he says, and I'm quoting from in which Kripke published his John Locke lectures. I'm not going to discuss the merits of this kind of logic or its utility for the general case of empty names. Such logics are now called free logics. And mind the fact that that was 1973. And they have a certain role in the literature. I think they are important. In fact, for making the philosophical point that if one treated names as Singular terms, instead of parsing them out by invented predicates, as Quine does, just a short parenthesis. You may know that in the methods of logic, Quine uh, invented this notation in which he dispensed with his names, just to dispense with uh, the idea of, of uh, uh, intention and reference. And instead of having names, you have a, a predicate which uniquely pick, picks out a given individual in the domain of, or in the extension of that predicate. So for instance, instead of using Socrates, Quine prefers to say is Socratizing. And then uh, the object, which is in the extension of the predicate is Socratizes, is that object, which presumably is the reference of the name Socrates. So that's a technical uh, device that Quine was inventing. And this is the device at which uh, Kripke uh, refers here. So one would not, to continue Kripke's uh, quote, one would not be forced to conclude that there is a winged horse or that there is God without further ado, where the formal conclusion is false and the latter controversial. I do think they, by which he means free logics, are useful for that purpose. Now, let me give you a very brief presentation of the main systems of free logic with the understanding that only one of those three systems is the one that is useful for uh, Sainsbury's purposes. And that is the first kind of system that I'm going to present now. <clears throat> okay, so in general, logic free of existential presuppositions is a branch of philosophical logic, which has been developed in the last 40 years. The existential presuppositions are linked with singular and general terms. Accordingly, the concept of a free logic 
was understood as the logic as logic free of existential presuppositions with respect to its singular and general terms. Uh, we know that standard first order logic with identity is almost fully free with respect to its general terms or predicates. There is only one exception though, namely universal terms or predicates like P of X or not P of X or X is identical to X. In first order logic with identity, the a sentence, there is at least one X such that P of X or not P of X, and there is at least one X such that X equals X are valid. And we can read the latter as something exists. And this seems to express a truth of ontology rather than a truth of logic. So it seems that uh, one uh, uh, drawback of uh, standard first order logic is the fact that some sentences which we deem as being part of ontology come out as being valid in logic. And that was one of the motivations people try to explore some alternatives to standard first order logic and free logic is one such alternative. The main concern of free logic has been existential presuppositions with respect to singular terms, to names or variables under assignments. For in standard first order logic with identity, we have for every singular term T and variable V, the valid formula, there is at least one V, V equals T, which means that T exists. And due to the ontological commitment of singular terms, in first order logic with identity, we have rules for quantifiers, such as existential introduction and universal elimination, which are not sound if the terms do not refer to actually existing things. Now, against this motivational background, an adequate definition of free logic has to include three components. Thus, a logical system LF is a free logic, if and only if, and now you can look at the slide 26. Uh, LF is free of existential presuppositions with respect to the singular terms of the language of the logic. LF is free of existential presuppositions with respect to the general terms of the language and the quantity quantifiers of LF have existential import. So the quantifiers actually behave the same uh, as in standard third order logic. What we change, for instance, so people who know uh, uh, natural deduction, uh, Genson style, what we change is the concept of an instance of a quantified sentence. For instance, instead of having for a universal uh, sentence, just a singular sentence, uh, uh, in which we use a name instead of the variable, what we have is a conditional to the effect that if the referent of the name exists, then, then the referent satisfied a, a certain condition. Whereas for the existentially quantified sentence, the instance is a conjunction to the effect that the referent of the term exists and the referent satisfies a certain condition phi. So it is appropriate to speak about a family of systems of free logic. And the distinctive feature of those systems is the fact that singular terms, which are empty or non-denoting, have a legitimate place in this family of logic systems, which is not the case for first order logic. Moreover, the theorems of a free logic system are valid even if the singular terms which occur in them are empty. There are three types of free logic systems. And the criterion according to which we can distinguish between those types is whether or not elementary sentences containing empty singular terms are true or false or else lack any truth value at all. We get thereby the following three types. A logical system LF minus or NFL is a negative uh, free logic if and only if LF is a free logic and every atomic sentence of the language of that logic containing at least one empty singular term is false. So according to this logic, uh, a sentence like uh, Hamlet exists is actually a false sentence because Hamlet is empty uh, singular term. Then again, a logical system is a positive free logic if and only if uh, the logic is a free logic and there is at least one true atomic sentence of the language containing at least one empty singular term. 
which is true. Uh, last but not least, a logical system uh, LFN is a neutral logic, even only if uh, it is a free logic and every atomic sentence of the language containing at least one empty singular term has no truth value at all. Now, alongside with those three types of free logic system, systems, there are the following three semantic approaches. Uh, the first approach is semantics with a partial interpretation function and a total valuation function. The second approach, the semantics with an inner and an outer domain, and this uses a total interpretation function and a total valuation function. And the last system here is the supervaluation semantics. Uh, this type of semantics uses a partial and a total interpretation function, and then a total and two partial valuation functions. Now, each type of uh, semantic system specifies its own type of models, M. As usual, a model M consists in a domain D and uh, an interpretation function I, which is associated with a valuation function V. I is always defined on the set of descriptive symbols, that is non-logical predicates and individual constants of the language of that free logic system. Now, what is distinctive for the semantics for free logic is that I is not supposed to assign an existing object to each individual constant. I therefore assigns to some individual constant T of the language either a non-existing object or no object at all. In the second case, I of T remains undefined and I therefore is a partial function. The valuation functions V, which are based on the interpretation functions I are always defined on the set of closed formulae of the language. They can be either total or partial. Now the first uh, kind of semantics, the semantics with a partial interpretation function and the total valuation function. Now here, an M model is an ordered pair, which uh, comprises a possibly empty domain D and a partial function I, uh, such that uh, for every individual constant T of the language, uh, either I does not assign anything at all to T, and uh, uh, I of T thereby remains undefined, or else the interpretation function I uh, assigns to the constant T an object which belongs to the domain D. So that's the first clause in the definition of a model for this kind of semantics, with partial interpretation function and total valuation function. So MPITV for short. Then the second clause for every n plus predicate or relation, um, um, the extension of the predicate p to the n is an object which belongs to the Cartesian product uh, d to the n. And the third clause for defining this kind of models, for every object in uh, big D, there is an individual constant t of the language such that the interpretation function is going to assign to that constant to that name, that object D. In other words, the interpretation function I of this kind of models provides a full or complete interpretation of the associated domain D. So all the objects in D get eventually um, uh, a name which uh, re refers to them. Next, we define truth and falsehood in a model M for every closed formula A of the language of this kind of logic. And we do this by defining a total valuation function V from the set of closed formula of the language into the set of truth values, true and false. And we do in the following way, in this recursive way. So the first uh, clause for this valuation function V uh, a relation P of T1 through Tn is true if and only if for every T sub I, uh, 
the term t sub i is defined according to the interpretation function i and the n tuple which is uh, formed using the names t1 through tn uh, belongs to the extension of the relation p to the n in this interpretation the second clause governs the identity so an identity sentence t1 equals t2 is true in a given valuation function if and only if both terms are defined so t1 is defined t2 is defined and t1 and t2 refer to the very same object the third rule the third clause governs uh, the existence predicate so t exists if and only if the term is defined the term refers to something which exists in the domain d and uh, this is actually a telling feature of free logic we can discuss that more in the Q and A section, because according to free logicians, existence is a predicate of individual objects. Existence is not a predicate of concepts, like in the Fregean tradition or the Kant Frege tradition. Existence is a first order predicate which attaches, which applies to individual objects. Then we have the usual clauses for uh, sentential connectives. So, number four, the negation of a sentence A is true if and only if the sentence itself is is not true. Uh, the conditional is uh, how we expect it to be. A conditional is true if and only if either the antecedent is uh, not true uh, or the consequent is true or both. Uh, then uh, the universal quantification uh, gets uh, the truth value true if and only if for every individual constant t, uh, t is defined and the instance which is formed with that constant t is true. So each and every instance is true, provided t is defined. And the last clause uh, uh, gives a sort of closure. A is false if and only if A is not true. Now, uh, I guess addition of quantifiers is shown in clause number six. So in this one, okay is a substitutional interpretation. So uh, it is obligatory that the interpretation functions of the models provide a complete interpretation. And the semantic concepts of validity, logical consequence and satisfiability are defined in the usual way. Uh, the system uh, LF minus of negative free logic is adequate, that is sound and complete with respect to the semantics with a partial interpretation function and a total valuation function. However, it is worth mentioning that by a change of clauses one and two above, so those two clauses here, we can change slightly those two clauses, uh, we can adapt uh, the models for uh, these semantics in such a way that they can be used for proving the adequacy of systems of positive free logic. So as far as the technical stuff is concerned, this is what Sainsbury needs. This kind of uh, free logic semantics with a partial interpretation function and a total valuation function. So uh, in the interest of time, and here I, I'm asking Paula, uh, I spoke for, uh, I don't know, maybe 40 minutes now, and I still have like 25 or 30 minutes. I guess I could skip uh, those uh, sections on the semantics with an inner and outer domain and supervaluation semantics. Anyhow, this uh, stuff I can share with you, I can send you the slides. And the part of this research, which is by the way, a joint, joint research with a philosopher from New Zealand, Fred Kroon, was published some years ago, and this is work in progress still for me. So if you consider, Paul, I can skip uh, the technical part uh, in this uh, presentation of the semantics because the part that I presented is sufficient in order to understand uh, what Sainsbury is up to. What do you think? Well, I think it's up you, to you, Professor, as you, as you wish. Yeah, because I, I also want to leave uh, time for uh, for discussion. So let me just go very quickly through okay. those two other types of semantics. 
there might be people who do not know this stuff and maybe that's uh, informative for them. So this semantics with an inner and an outer domain is the usual semantics that we use now in the possible order semantics for um, first order model logic. <clears throat> so model logic with quantifiers. And here we define a model is a triple in which we have uh, two domains, which are disjoint. D sub O mean, means the outer domain and D sub I means the inner domain. Uh, intuitively, the inner domain is the domain of the existence of a given interpretation. And the outer domain is uh, the domain in which we put the merely possible objects. So actually those two domains are disjoint. The union of uh, the two domains is non-empty and we define big D, which is the domain of the whole interpretation as the union of those two domains. This kind of semantics is the semantics for my non-Gianism as well, in which we make sense and we leave room for merely possible objects. I don't know, like the golden mountain or the unicorn. Here we have an interpretation function, which is total. Uh, so every term of the language gets uh, a referent, either in uh, the inner domain or else in the outer domain. The evaluation function also uh, is total and it assigns a truth value uh, to each closed formula relative to this model. Uh, the evaluation is defined recursively in the following way. So a relation is true if and only if the n tuple belongs to the extension of the relation under that interpretation. Uh, the identity sentence is true if and only if uh, the two terms refer to the very same object, but mind the fact that in this case, in contradistinction to the previous semantics, we do not require that the terms be defined in the sense that the terms gets uh, uh, referent in the inner domain. Uh, then again, look, uh, T exists in, in and only if, if and only if the referent of T belongs to the inner domain. So that was basically the motivation, the main intuition. We say that the inner domain of the interpretation is the domain of the existence of that interpretation. And then we have the uh, uh, rules for the connectives. Not A is true if and only if A is not true. The conditional is true if and only if either the antecedent is not true or the consequent is true or both. Then we have again uh, that substitutional interpretation for the universal quantifier and for the existential quantifier as well. So uh, universally quantified sentence is true if and only if each and every instance of that sentence is true. Uh, and uh, again, A is false if and only if A is not true. Now the models in this kind of uh, free logic or positive uh, in this kind of logic with inner and outer domain are used mainly for positive free logic. And uh, there are uh, proofs which show that uh, um, given positive free logic uh, is adequate with respect to uh, these models in which we use uh, inner and outer domains. <clears throat> Now we get to super evaluation semantics, which is uh, a bit more uh, sophisticated. Uh, and uh, the philosophical motivation for coming up with super evaluation semantics, especially in this, uh, in this uh, uh, field, there are some other motivations for some other fields. Like for instance, Keith Fine used super evaluation semantics in order to cope with vagueness in a classic paper from 1975. But in the context that uh, we have here, the motivation is rejecting Meinongianism. Now, since Meinongianism is not appealing for everybody, which makes the inner outer domain semantics not uh, favorite for all, the question arises how to develop a semantics appropriate for a positive free logic without using the inner outer domain semantics. And uh, the answer was this supervaluation semantics. Uh, which starts with models of the same type as in the first approach. So partial interpretation function and total valuation functions. However, however, uh, atomic sentences containing empty singular terms are allowed to be truth valueless. So here actually we make room to the idea that there are sentences 
uh, which uh, lack any truth value. In uh, uh, the semantics with partial interpretation and total valuation, those kinds of sentences come out false. I mean, if we have a sentence in which at least one term is empty, then that atomic sentence is false. But in supervaluation semantics, we allow for this intuition that we do not have a definite, a determinate truth value for that kind of sentences in which at least one singular term is empty. But this, I mean, this uh, 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 flexibility would result in a rejection of the classical laws of logic. And uh, in order to avoid this effect, the models are completed. And this is where this technique invented by Bas van Frassen actually is uh, useful. So, <clears throat> Uh, this is why we need to build a new type of models, MSV, uh, for supervaluation. Uh, and uh, the definition uh, uh, is uh, the following. First of all, we define the concept of interpretation, which is associated with these kind of models. And uh, an interpretation is a structure of the following sort. For every individual constant T of the language of logic, Either the interpretation does not assign anything at all to T and T thereby remains undefined or else the interpretation uh, interprets the constant T as being the name of an object in big D. Then for every n place predicate P to the n, for every uh, n place relation, uh, the extension of that relation is uh, included in the Cartesian product d to the n. And uh, thirdly, for every object small d belonging to big D, there is an individual constant t of the language such that the constant names or refers to that object. So again, the model is full or complete. However, unlike the valuation function for partial interpretation and total valuation semantics, the valuation function VSV associated with this kind of uh, supervaluation models is also a partial function. So recall the fact that in the semantics that Sainsbury is uh, using for NFL, the valuation function is total. But at this stage, when we have uh, atomic sentences at this uh, starting point, some uh, 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 models to be partial, to have this kind of partial function. Uh, and its domain of the function is restricted to atomic formula. So mind this fact that only to the atomic formula in which uh, non-referring terms are occurring. Consequently, the evaluation function V is a partial function from closed atomic formula of the language into the set of truth values and the valuation function is defined as follows. For any t sub i, uh, t sub i um, defined, then the relation uh, p of t1 through tn is the case if and only if the n tuple, okay, uh, uh, which is denoted by that sequence of terms t1 through tn belongs to uh, the extension of the relation, belongs to i of p to the n. But then if for at least one such t sub i, the term is undefined, then the relation itself is undefined. So that is under 1d. 2a, if both terms t1 and t2 are defined, then the identity sentence is true if and only if the two terms co-refer. The two terms refer to the very same uh, uh, object. Uh, to be if either T1 or T2 is undefined, by the, but the other is defined. So the idea is that if only one of the two terms is undefined, whereas the other one is defined, then the identity sentence is false. Okay, so if we have something of that sort, Hamlet is identical with, uh, I don't know, with a uh, uh, one of the child of Shakespeare, or some children of Shakespeare, or that kind of, of thing. Yeah, that identity is false because Hamlet is not defined. Uh, but then again, if neither T1 nor T2 is defined, then the identity sentence is undefined. Then I have uh, the rule for the existence. 
uh, existence is again a first order predicate. So T exists if and only if the term is defined and uh, T exists is false if and only if T, the term T is not defined. We define now the concept of completion of, a, of an MSV model and uh, the completion is relative to the MSV model. So we have MCSV, the completion of the supervaluation model which is a domain D prime and an interpretation function I completion supervaluation. And that's a completion of, of MSV if and only if D prime is non-empty and D is included in D prime. And then for every N plus predicate, the extension of the predicate is uh, uh, included, the extension of the predicate un under the supervaluation interpretation is included in the extension of the very same predicate under the complete supervaluation interpretation. Uh, and then uh, rule number four, for every indi individual constant T, if uh, the referent of T according to the supervaluation interpretation is defined, then the very same referent uh, stays put for the term when we complete that supervaluation interpretation. So this is the meaning of that ICSV of T equals ICV of T. Uh, rule number five, for every individual constant T, uh, uh, domain D prime of the model of complete supervaluation uh, under the interpretation of complete supervaluation. Now, uh, rules one through four uh, say that uh, the model of complete supervaluation is a super model of the model of supervaluation. And clause number five, okay, this one, clause number five is a total function, and MCSV is accordingly complete. And now from the point of view of an MSV model of which MCSV is a completion, the valuation function V of this MCSV model is a total function. So eventually we get a total function of valuation. We get something which is classic. Each sentence is either true or false. And here we have uh, the usual uh, clauses for defining recursively the valuation function. But uh, the main uh, thrust of the construction, I guess, is uh, obvious now. So at the basic level, we may have atomic sentences which are truth value less. And then we build some models in which we let in the beginning some valuation function to be not defined, to be partial. But in the end of the day, we are going to close that off and actually all the valuation functions are going to be fully defined. And uh, as I already said, uh, this uh, uh, supervaluation semantics has been used by Bas van Frassen in order to prove soundness and completeness of positive free logic with identity. So again, supervaluation semantics is not the one that is required or is needed by RWR, by the construction that we uh, discuss, we explore now, Sainsbury's construction. So let me now, uh, in maybe 15 minutes or so, let me now uh, go back to RWR and to comment upon Sainsbury option for negative free logic and to see whether or not this tool is adequate for what Sainsbury is up to. Now I begin with the question to what extent the Davisonian framework is the best framework for Sainsbury's purposes. For Davidson, the theory of radical interpretation shows that the reference is a derivative and indeed an instrumental relation. Okay, 
On this approach, there are no underlying referential facts that determine the right truth conditions for our sentences. And Sainsbury challenges the derivativeness of reference in his last chapter. He thinks, by the way, non-linguistic animals may have a capacity for non-linguistic reference. Although he thinks that the success of this challenge is not essential to the official series of RWR on page 59. But there is a sense in which a view like RWR sits unhappily with the thought that reference is derivative, that the interpretation is primary. And this is especially so given the adoption of negative free logic. For when it comes to NFL, knowing and grasping conditional truth conditions is not even enough for knowing whether an expression has a referent. Knowing the latter requires us to know whether anything is determined as the referent of the expression. It requires us to know a basic, basic referential fact. And this brings us to a second question. RWR does not advocate an official theory of how reference is determined. For example, in the case of names. Like some familiar versions of millennialism, it seems to regard this as a kind of pre-semantic matter. And its official semantic theory holds that referring expressions, including ones that fail to secure reference, are associated with reference conditions rather than reference, and that these conditions are public. But this leaves it unclear just what is publicly known when speakers and hearers grasp reference conditions and how what is publicly known feeds into certain crucial abilities they have with names, such as the ability to work out, perhaps with the help of others, who is referred to with a name and whether a name really has a referent. It is arguably, I guess, that these are not accidental abilities, but part and parcel of the reason why we have name using practices. Such abilities are needed if name using practices are to feel, fulfill their role of allowing the acquisition and sharing of information about the reference of names. Now, descriptivism, say as understood by Frank Jackson, places great stress on such features, which he, Frank Jackson, regards as an essential part of the public profile of names and part of what makes names the public currency they are. Millianism understands the public nature of names, what we assert as a right when using a name and what we grasp in acquiring the ability to use a name in a very different way. Sainsbury rightly points to problems with such views, but one wishes that RWR had more to say about how public knowledge of semantic reference conditions is connected to features of name using practices highlighted by other traditions. Until this is done, adherents of these other traditions may well suspect that Sainsbury's account of the nature and role of reference conditions will in the end reduce to something closer to their own account of the semantics of referring expressions. So I wouldn't say that Sainsbury could solve this problem to get rid of either Fregianism or uh, Rassilianism in his synthesis. Now, these methodological points aside, let us return to the actual details of the way in which RWR approaches the issue of empty referring expressions. Sainsbury's avowed goal is to make a convincing case for the claim that RWR offers the right framework for understanding the semantic behavior of all such terms, no matter what the context. But how successful is his defense of RWR? Now, by focusing on some of its notable successes, Sainsbury certainly establishes that RWR gets us a long way. One such success is the account of the truth conditions of negative existentials. A second success concerns fiction. And as the chapter on fiction and existence reminds us, 
RWR has nothing to fear from proofs like Holmes is a detective. The fact that <clears throat> NFL counts this fictional sentence as strictly false is irrelevant. For to the extent that we regard the sentence as true, maybe some of you are hearing Holmes is a detective as a true sentence. So to the regard that that is the case, we regard the sentence as prefixed with an implicitly intentional operator in the fiction. Because this leaves the fictional name shielded by an intentional operator, NFL can no longer be used to show that the sentence is false. Now, Sainsbury acknowledges that extra fictional tools such as Tony Blair admires Coriolanus pose more of a problem and he sees these as requiring more work. But he adamantly rejects views that appeal to special fictional objects in order to cope with such examples. A famous example is Kripke's view on such context. And by the way, you can actually look again through Kripke's uh, monograph, Reverence and Existence. Well, I think, however, that the difficulties run rather deeper than Sainsbury makes out. As the problem of extra fictional truths like Tony Blair admires Coriolanus shows, what makes it so hard to get by on the thin ontological diet recommended by RWR is that much of what we want to say using fictional and other seemingly empty referring expressions seems to carry a straightforward commitment to non-existent objects. And Sainsbury hopes that he can find analysis that isolate such terms behind appropriate intentional operators, but as a general strategy, this seems rather dubious to me. <clears throat> now the problem even arises in the case of the scene content style of reports that we men I mentioned earlier. So number one, hallucinating a little green man, she said that he was bold. I think that such constructions prove too much for they are prone to a curious kind of leak. Reporters can exploit elements of the scene in order to say things that go beyond mere content. Suppose for example, that the reporter wishes to make explicit the way the reported speaker executed uh, in reality her demonstration. And the reporter can do this by saying, number two, hallucinating a little green man in the corner of the garden, she pointed at him and said that he was bold. Now this way of describing the reported speaker's contribution seems no less appropriate. Indeed, it is more informative and in certain cases, such reporting may be necessary as when the reported speaker hallucinated too many objects and the reporter wants to signal how the speaker discriminated them. But <clears throat> Sainsbury's acceptance of NFL means he would count a report like number two, this one, hallucinating a little green man in the corner of the garden, she pointed at him and said that he was bold, as false since it incorporates a simple relational claim, she pointed at him, that involves an empty term, namely him. There's nothing out there to answer to him because actually to begin with, uh, uh, the lady was hallucinating, a little green man. Now I think that Sainsbury's account fails to capture a sense in which by uttering those two sentences, our reporter shows himself to be entering into commitments that at another level he repudiates. And this seems crucial to me and I'm going to comment a bit at the end of my presentation about this two level engagement of ours. At the first level, we speculatively engage in a sort of talk, but on a more fundamental and profound level, actually we disavow that kind of talk. We engage in a sort of, I don't know, Hamlet or Vulcan or Sherlock Holmes talk, 
But as a matter of fact, we reject the fact that those entities are real. Now, I think that a version of this problem even affects Sainsbury's dazzling straightforward solution to the problem of true negative existentials. Uh, recall that a sentence like Vulcan does not exist comes out as true on NFL because the simple sentence Vulcan exists is false. Vulcan being non-referring. But as Sainsbury acknowledges, there are problems with this kind of explanation. Uh, one is that a statement like Vulcan is not a planet should then also count as true. And for exactly the same reason. And this seems wrong. Know that we can't retreat to the view that our sense of falsity in this case can be explained in terms of the falsity of the internally negated claim Vulcan is a non-planet. Because that would suggest that we should hear Vulcan is non-existent as similarly false, which of course we don't. But there is what seems to me a deeper problem. Sainsbury's account is an account of the simplest kind of negative existential. Cases of the form N doesn't exist. But negative existentials are often much more complex and often in ways that threaten the role of NFL. Suppose, for example, that we utter the simple negative existential, Vulcan does not exist, number three. Uh, three is a sentence that seems very counts as true. But our utterance of three may well not exist in isolation. It may prompt a request for clarification, such as, what do you mean uh, it doesn't exist? Is it a fictional planet, maybe? And that is why we might add as a clarification, number four, Vulcan is one of the many failed posits of the 19th century science. It was a planet posit to explain certain astronomical phenomena, but something other than the movement of Vulcan provided the correct explanation. Now, however, that four is false from the point of view of NFL, since it contains as a conjunct, a simple affirmative statement involving an empty name. Vulcan was a planet positive to explain certain astronomical phenomena. Yet four is surely no more contentious than three. It simply provides more information, clarifying or perhaps explaining what may it's free true. Again, this is free. Vulcan does not exist. Okay, so there is no reason to say that number four is more contentious than number three. And we take number three as being true. Whereas number four, which is just an explanation of number three, comes out false under NFL. So Four is surely no more contentious than three. It simply provides more information clarifying or perhaps explaining what makes three true. In some sense, its truth, the truth of four is what grounds the truth of three. Now note that NFL's reasons for classifying four as false go even further. For sentence number four contains apparent quantification over non-existent things, failed posits of the 19th century, and for negative free logic, all quantification is over existent things. There is nothing else to quantify over. Assuming that such quantification is objectual rather than substitutional, the apparent truth of claims like four yields another challenge for negative free logic. Sentence number four is not the only way we might clarify a negative existential like three, Vulcan does not exist. At other times, we might wish to clarify just what we are talking about by offering an alternative way of identifying our target object. And this is how we can come up with number five. Vulcan, you know, the planet described in that interesting paper by Le Verrier that we have been reading last summer. Well, it doesn't exist. 
Now, suppose that sentence number five is true, that it correctly provides an alternative way of identifying Vulcan, that planet uh, which we uh, read a paper by Le Verrier. Okay, but how should we understand the logical role of the relative clause? I mean, this one here. You know, the planet described in that interesting paper by Le Verrier that we have been reading. Uh, we see just two options. The first is to read five as a simple conjunction, which is number six. Vulcan is the planet described in that interesting paper by Le Verrier that we have been reading and it, Vulcan does not exist, okay? And the second reading is to treat the relative clause as part of a complex definite description that also features the name Vulcan. The thing X such that X is identical to Vulcan and X is the planet described by Le Verrier does not exist. Okay. Now, which reading is the right one? Now, given that five is true, so again, five is uh, this. Vulcan, you know, the planet described in the paper by Le Verrier does not exist. Given that this is true, I guess what we need is a clarification of that, which also should be true. The problem is that number six is false under NFL. Why? Because number six is a conjunction and the second conjunct, Vulcan does not exist. Uh, okay, so let me, let me see here. Now let me start with, uh, yeah, with number seven. So seven seems promising for the description it uses is non-referring, which makes seven true by the lights of NFL. But know that this reading of five is quite unintended since three by itself entails seven. I mean by that, that uh, Vulcan does not exist entails the thing X such that X is identical to Vulcan and X is described by Leveria does not exist. And it also entails any other negative existential of the form the X such that X equals Vulcan and Phi does not exist. For according to NFL, if Vulcan does not exist is true, that is because the name Vulcan is empty. As a result, any compound description, the X such that X is Vulcan and Phi will be empty as well, making the sentence, the X such that X is identical to Vulcan and Phi does not exist also true. But clearly it's free, Vulcan does not exist, maybe true without five. That is without Vulcan does not exist and Vulcan is the planet that is described by Le Verrier and we read that paper by Le Verrier. And this could be fa false because actually we did not read uh, that uh, paper by Le Verrier. So the reason that uh, the sentence is true is not the fact that uh, we read that paper by Le Verrier. Hence, uh, the reading number seven or number five cannot be the right reading of that sentence. So that leaves us with number six, that is Vulcan is the planet described in that interesting paper by Le Verrier that we have been reading and it, Vulcan does not exist as the only viable reading of number five. But now the problem is clear because C, six and hence five is false according to NFL since one of its conjuncts is false, namely, the first conjunct, which says that Vulcan is the planet described in that intense paper. Why is this false according to NFL? Because Vulcan does not refer to anything. In short, even if NFL does well on simple negative existentials like three, it does poorly on complex negative existentials like five. Now, just how to understand negative existentials in the light of such problems remains a deep challenge for any theory that tries to be ontological or stir in the manner of RWR. There are no less a problem for million attempts to deal with empty names, of course. So regards reliance on NFL means that it doesn't easily escape them. Some glimpses beyond, and I'm going to finish in maybe less than five minutes. 
I think that much more should be made of the intuition that in uttering such statements, we speculatively engage with commitments of those whose commitments we do not share. In some sense, a speaker who engages in, let's say, Vulcan talk, even when her aim is to disown such talk, is going along with the thought, is pretending that there is such a thing. A related suggestion has been made by David Williams, although only in the context of symbol negative existentials, and is sympathetically discussed by Sainsbury himself. Applied more widely, such a suggestion may get us close to some kind of pretense theory, which might be a better solution than negative free logic. But nevertheless, Sainsbury adamantly turns his face against the kind of pretense theory that Evans, for example, offers us. He rejects the latter's refusal to count a name like Vulcan as genuinely intelligible rather than merely quasi-intelligible. And Sainsbury rejects the millianism of Ken Walton's version of pretense theory. Walton thinks that speakers merely pretend to affirm propositions when they knowingly use fictional being cryptic, his John Locke lectures. Now it remains unclear, for me at least, how RWR should go from here. Uh, whatever our view on this debate, one can't help but be impressed by RWR's single-minded focus, and in particular by the way it doggedly sticks to the view that names like Hamlet, Vulcan, and Pegasus or Sherlock Holmes are genuinely non-referring and then tries to understand the semantic behavior of such terms in a way that invokes nothing more than the semantic machinery and ontology needed for ordinary terms. Well, I guess I'm going to stop here. The last slides of my presentations are just a very, very rough sketch of a material which you can find in a Kit Fine Semantic Relationism in uh, the addenda, in the appendix of uh, that uh, short monograph in which uh, Kit Fines is addressing the issue of empty or non-referring terms. And I have some uh, comments and some ideas about that, but uh, uh, I guess I leave it to that. The very same idea, I guess it comes up in, uh, in another form in, uh, in Kit Fines approach, uh, which is this idea that again, we speculatively engage with the commitments of a talk that actually we disavow. So we engage with the commitments of those whose commitments we do not share. And this is also something incidentally very interesting for the way we can solve some big disagreements of ours. Uh, when we have uh, sharp disagreements about uh, values or about some other important philosophical, metaphysical, religious stuff, initially we can engage in a speculative manner and uh, sort of pretend that uh, in a polite manner, pretend that we engage into the very same ontology, but in the end of the day, we disavow uh, the commitment to those entities. Okay, so that would be all now, and thank you very much. I guess I was a bit longer than I expected. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Dimitro, for your presentation. Um, now we can start the Q&A part. I kindly ask you to write in the chat if you have a question or a follow-up. Mr. Lodoshan raised his hand. We cannot hear you. Oh, he's uh, supposed to write? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was just applauding your presentation. Congratulations. <laughs> okay, so we have- Yeah, that. I saw just one hand. You need two hands in order to applaud, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, Adrian. So let's start with the- So with Mr. That. Zeman has a question. Yeah. Yeah, hi, thanks. Um, thanks for that. Should I go on in English or switch to Romanian? How should we do this? I'm happy to go in English. Yeah, Can whatever you like. I don't know. Okay, so uh, I have a, I mean, I have a question that I'm not sure yes, might, yes, turn, might, might turn into an objection or not. I have to see. So I'm a bit unclear about your uh, discussion of the, like the reported case with the, you know, this, you call them scenes and stuff like that. Uh, with the person who's hallucinating the green man. Uh, so the, these were examples one and two. I don't know if you can, can go back to them or not. 
but anyway, so I the problem the problem you pointed out with two the problem that you pointed out with two it seems it seems to me uh, was that there is a relational thing uh, going on there between the person that is uh, referring or uh, to the bold man who's <laughs> who she herself has hallucinated. And it wasn't clear to me why exactly is that a problem for Sainsbury? Because again, I mean, the way you, you gave the example, maybe I'm mistaken. Uh, it seems to me that you were, so the example was something like, you know, having hallucinated this person there, uh, she did this and that, right? Uh, the mere fact that the hallucination part is brought in the example, that seems to me to indicate that maybe a way to treat this example is, is saying that, you know, there is already this, intentional operator there, namely in the hallucination, uh, that that is what, you know, what the, the content of the, the, the sentence should be taken to uh, pertain to. I think you went a bit too far now. Yeah. Well, never mind. I mean, uh, is it- So here I you have the example. Yeah, so I, I meant the case in which so when you're already moving to Sainsbury's view and then he apparently says, there's somebody who reports this person. Exactly, I think that's it, yeah? Maybe, mm -hmm. yeah. Or maybe not. Uh, yeah. No, no, it's, it's not, this is not the example, but never mind. So your problem was that there is an issue with the report in that it comes, it comes out as false according to Sainsbury, whereas intuitively we think it three, we think it through. And I wasn't sure that's that's the case. And the reason I'm saying this is that, you know, this person saying hallucinating a little green man, uh, her, she pointed towards him and something, something. The question is, why cannot be this first part the hallucinating green little man be interpreted as a kind of intention operator that can that applies to the whole sentence. And then of course in the, or the whole content that follows afterwards. And then in the hallucination, it's true that she, <laughs> I mean, it's true that she points to the uh, to this green man that she hallucinates, right? So why isn't that a, why isn't that a solution that Sainsbury can yeah. adopt? Gen and also generally, if I may add just one more thing, that I'm, I wasn't exactly clear what this intentional operators how exactly are supposed to work. I mean, are we talking about uh, are we talking about yes? Yeah, so this is example one, and then the next one two is when you have the report, right? I mean, the other report is that both reports. Right. Uh, so the question, so the general question I have, how exactly do these operators work? Are, are we talking about sentential operators? Are we talking about, you know, less than sentential operators and so on and so forth? That's probably a choice point that uh, Sainsbury has to make, to make or, you know, anybody else. And I was wondering if you go that route, then you maybe can already solve this issue. So I don't know if I'm making a lot of sense, but hopefully, is, was the question clear? So oh, let's let's take them in turn. So we have this uh, yeah. report, hallucinating yeah. the little green man. She said that he was bald. Right. So th that is the interpretation of the reporter. Okay, because the reporter knew that there was no little green man in the corner and uh, was reporting. And then, the, hmm? yeah, the reporter wants to make sense. Uh, to interpret in a sort of uh, uh, um, meaningful way um, what she was saying. And this is why the reporter is saying, hallucinating a little green man, she said that he was bald. So right. in reality, so no, there no was problem no, here. Uh, yeah. green man there. Right. And uh, since, uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, my comment was that uh, this kind of constructions prove too much. Uh, because reporters can exploit elements of the scene in order to say things that go beyond mere content, beyond what uh, actually the uh, lady said, the lady that uh, was reported by the reporter. And then uh, we uh, give the following uh, uh, alternative uh, re reading, hallucinating a little green man in the corner of the garden, she pointed at him and said that he was bald. So, uh, what Sainsbury is saying uh, about, uh, according to NFL, 
because uh, she pointed that he, according to the way the reporter is interpreting and uh, reports the uh, sentence that the lady actually occurred. Uh, why, according to NFL, the sentence, this interpretation is false? Because she pointed that him is false because him uh, is empty. Okay? Right. We are okay with that? Uh, yeah, and uh, right, so that would be a problem because we think two is true. So it should not be, I mean, it cannot be true if it's empty. Is, is that the case? If it is uh, empty, then according to NFL, it should be false. Right, and the intuition we have is that it's true or something like that. The intuition is that if you, are, if you are charitable enough, we can understand why the reporter said that hallucinating a bit. And uh, according to this uh, report, we are going to say at least some of us could have the intuition that uh, the sentence is true and not false. Okay. Right. Yeah. And so then my counter, like maybe this is a proposal to help Sainsbury or something. I mean, if you if he already, mm -hmm. I mean, the, the example already mentions having hallucinated. So why isn't that? Why can't that be interpreted interpreted as a intentional operator, like, you know, in the hallucination, then everything else, or, you know, depending on your view of these operators, but like presumably everything else that's in the scope of that operator would refer, you know, would, would make things to refer to things, <laughs> sorry, would, would make expressions to refer to things in the, in the hallucination. Mm -hmm. So then him would be, you know, doesn't have to be, there's nobody there, but there's somebody in the hallucination. So that would make it true. So I, yeah, uh, I guess I, I, I get, I guess I get your point. I mean, yeah, I have in some other parts of my paper, this example, uh, this example. So uh, uh, literally Sherlock Holmes is a detective is false, but uh, if we uh, shield that with the intentional operator in the story, Sherlock Holmes is a detective, then the whole sentence is true. Even exactly. though Sherlock Holmes is a detective is false according to NFL. So yeah. uh, in the same vein, we can yeah. say that uh, uh, the little green man is bald is false. Even if uh, the lady points at something that she hallucinates, but if we shield that with the intentional operator hallucinating a bit, she said that uh, the little green man was bald, then that comes out true because in her hallucination, that is, that is, uh, that is the exactly. case. Yeah, yeah, that's the general point of view. Yeah. Of course, it depends how you would conceive of these operators, right? But that's a more general mm -hmm. issue. Okay, thank you. Well, I guess in some other parts in RWR, in RWR, it seems that Sainsbury is not so happy with the fact that uh, shielding with intentional operators, you deflect actually this uh, lack in explicative power of NFL. I mean, eventually you want to have a sort of uh, full and adequate interpretation, which according to, to NFL, which is uh, uh, not necessarily a sort of uh, intentional logic, you know, that's adding to the apparatus of uh, free logic, adding something which is highly or hyper-intentional, like hallucinating or something of that sort. So I guess I have to look back at uh, his, uh, his own uh, uh, comments about whether or not just using as a general strategy, this embedding in intentional context is going to help him and to actually help the NFL approach. Yeah, I need right. to look back yeah, at that enough. and to see whether or not Sainsbury would be happy with that. If, if that coheres yeah. with the other part of his strategy of using NFL. Yeah, right. good, Thanks. good point. Thank you. Uh, next one is Andrei. Good evening, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, okay. yes, Andrei. So thanks so much for your talk. Uh, this was absolutely delightful. I very much enjoyed it. Um, I had a broadly historical question. Um, I was wondering, uh, thinking back of Mark Sainsbury and the UT years, um, I couldn't help remembering of, um, um, Laugi Kaktunan and uh, his idea of discourse mm -hmm. reference, right? And part of uh, Kaktunan's idea, and this was um, uh, picked up by Hans Kamp, 
was that uh, we sort of shift the goalposts when we talk about the relationship between semantics and pragmatics, right? And so it's not entirely obvious that a, um, a free logic approach to fiction, uh, an approach that's distinctively and purely semantic is going to, in some sense, uh, fully capture the notion of discourse reference that's meant to inhabit that no man's land between semantics and pragmatics. Um, and if uh, we deem fiction the way we deem uh, uh, discourse reference and the initial motivations for this were quite different, right? And after uh, and uh, direct and indirect objects and so on. Um, if we do that, then there's going to be a question about the initial motivation for the very project that, that Mark Sainsbury has embarked on. And um, uh, this isn't in any way uh, critical of your particular um, uh, critical approach to, to, to Sainsbury. Um, I'm just wondering um, how you'd like to uh, fit in that uh, historical thread. So thanks, thanks again. Okay, very good point. So it looks uh, as like a critique is directing towards Sainsbury than toward my own approach to Sainsbury because I am aiming at maybe at the very same uh, sort of, uh, of uh, uh, picture in which semantics per se is not enough in order to make sense of the content and of the various intentions that we have when we use pretense and fiction. Uh, fact is that Sainsbury wants a solution on this semantic level because free logic and NFL and that kind of semantics is partial interpretation and total variation is only a semantic, maybe a purely semantic approach. And uh, the fact that I pointed out some, uh, some drawbacks of his analysis maybe is also uh, 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 an echo of uh, my deep need to move further and further towards a sort of pragmatic, semantic plus pragmatic solution. And if you read back into my highlighted comments about speculatively engaging into some talk, but then disavowing that kind of talk, that actually has a sort of pragmatic component, a pragmatic of communication. So actually maybe the, the, main, uh, the main point that I'm making here is that not only NFL, but maybe more generally, uh, a purely semantic uh, solution is not adequate in order to understand what's going on with the content and the uh, 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 implications uh, of, uh, of fiction. When we say something and we implicate some other things uh, because we know what pretense and how pretense is working when we come up, um, come up with uh, pieces of fiction. So uh, I guess I'm pretty much uh, in favor, uh, in sympathy with the point that you are making. Um, by the way, I do not know uh, cartoon and paper. So maybe you'll give me a reference to that later. I heard of him, I didn't meet him uh, uh, so far, but I don't know in particular. So he was teaching you at uh, UT or uh, how come that uh, you uh, said so that you have some recollection of your time at UT? Right, no, no, um, Kaktunan was there uh, way before I was. Um, uh, he was there maybe 25, 30 years before, but uh, his spirit lived on as it were. I think he's now in Stanford, is retired or something like that, but um, uh, he's a terrific guy. Okay. And yes, but, but I fully agree with what you're saying. And I think um, uh, part of what's at issue is precisely this, um, um, this quandary as to what to do with fiction, right? Uh, uh, where to place it along the semantic pragmatic divide. And I, I think you're exactly right in, in, in wondering about that, yeah. So, you know, I gave you that quote from, from Kripke, that short quote about uh, free logics. And Kripke claims explicitly that free logics are useful tools. But then if you read uh, thoroughly his monograph, you see that he makes no use of uh, the philosophy of free logics, not to mention the technicalities. So there is no, uh, I don't know, logical machinery into that monograph. And the way he sees things with uh, pretense is very much, I guess, along the lines that I want to develop here. 
and that I guess pushes things towards pragmatics. And inter interestingly enough, I mean, if we make some historic comments, Kripke was giving those lectures at a, about the very same time when he wrote uh, the semantic uh, reference versus the uh, speaker's reference, which is also his uh, reaction to Don Ellen, uh, uh, theory of descriptions. And he introduces actually, he intimates this uh, the importance of this distinction between semantics and pragmatics. Thanks again. Okay, the next one is Thank you, Thank you very much for, for this extremely interesting presentation. I'm not highly familiarized with the topic. I only have one maybe naive question. What would, I don't know, Sainsbury says about, a, about for instance, dark energy? Is dark energy, because- About what, you, sorry, could dark, you say it again? About dark energy, uh, because you, you talked about fiction. Uh, dark, dark energy. Exactly. I mean, uh, is, uh, is dark energy any, uh, does dark energy as a term create any kind of challenge for this? Because it is not fiction, neither reality at this point, at least. I mean, it is something that scientists mm -hmm. say that might be real, but at this point, we don't know whether it's real or not. So uh, how could we approach mm -hmm. things like that? Like Vulcan at some point, you know, what was some sort of, uh, scientific creation, they believe that, okay, they, it might be a planet or something like that. So dark energy is in the same, uh, I mean, we, we relate to it the same way at this point. So I was wondering whether this had some sort of problem for, for this account. Thank you. Yeah, that's very interesting because we don't know as of yet whether or not there is dark energy. But uh, if we think in terms of Vulcan or of uh, phlogiston, for instance, we know that those are failed posits of some uh, precursors of our current science, of chemistry and of, uh, of astronomy. So uh, the issue is not at all easy, it's very complex, but I would say that uh, there are two opposing views here. One of them is to <clears throat> sort of uh, go fictionalist with regard to any kind of discourse in which you posit some entities which go beyond the merely observable entities. So from that perspective, uh, the language of science and the semantics of the language of science of mathematics and so on and so forth could be accounted in terms of fictionalism. And uh, I guess that kind of attitude was uh, backed and was motivated by the starting point of this whole debate. Well, actually it can be traced back to Kripke, but the paper by Gideon Rosen in which he interprets the possible world discourse in terms of uh, fiction, fictionalism. And he gives a sort of uh, philosophical rendering of the possible world semantics or model logic in terms of fictional entities and objects. But uh, there are some other philosophers, for instance, Keith Fine, I take, it, take him as being one of those, who insist that we have to discuss those different kinds of terms based on their own merits. And we have to discuss dark energy as something, I don't know, uh, between uh, theoretic entities, theoretic terms, and we don't know, surely it is not fully determined whether or not there is something out there which responds to that term, uh, but uh, nevertheless, the fictions uh, such like uh, Desdemona or Sherlock Holmes are in a different category than the uh, would-be uh, theoretic terms. So I am inclined to be, uh, uh, in favor of this more finely grade attitude, not to take everything as being a big fiction and then there are some uh, uh, subdivisions within that big hole, which is the fictional discourse. I, I tend to, to, to treat each example, each type of example based on its own uh, uh, value and merits. So I'm much more in favor of what Kit Fine is saying about, about this. There is a paper by Kit Fine in which he, uh, discusses uh, uh, the philosophy of mathematics of Parsons uh, and uh, in which he says that actually there are all sorts of terms which refer to non-observable entities, but some non-observable entities play a role in scientific discourse, like for instance, the dark energy where some other non-observable terms, uh, fiction, fiction, like I don't know, Hamlet or Sherlock Holmes. 
and we do not uh, treat them as a unitary category. Okay, Yovan. All right, a short question. Also, it may be naive, but uh, since free logic is so permissive, I was wondering, uh, are there any limits to free logic? What are its limitations? If there are any, maybe there are none. Yeah, well, yeah, this is a general issue, general question. I would uh, approach it just uh, highlighting an aspect that I alluded to in my presentation. So it seems to me that uh, when we do logic, uh, even though logic could have some metaphysical presuppositions, those presuppositions should be very few because I see a logic as being kind of neutral with regard to metaphysical programs, doctrines and theories which can be expressed, formulated within those logical languages, or we use logic in order to assess the merits of those metaphysical positions. Now, uh, that being said, if you look back at first order logic with identity, which is actually the logic of standard mathematics, you can go a bit farther up with second order logic, higher order logic, but you don't change that because first order logic, it's actually the common basis, the common denominator of, of all those constructions. So if you look back at that simple logic, which is the logic of quantifiers and predicates, you come up with this very odd result that a sentence which says that necessarily something exists is a logical truth. And then if you ponder that, you say, well, so logic is going to do as the service of ontology or metaphysics. So can we just use logic to prove that God exists or to prove that anything else exists? Because according to first order logic, everything exists. And then if you add on top of that, a bit of uh, model logic, you come up with necessarily everything exists with a sort of necessitarianism, which is Tim Williamson's position, by the way. So it seems that first order logic, even though it is very simple and it is the standard logic that Quine for instance favored over all the other logics is not at all neutral and is very bold in its conjectures. So this was one of the philosophical motivations to liberalize the semantics and the language and to reject this view, this idea that everything exists is just a logical truth, okay? So uh, all those types of systems in which we accept uh, terms which do not refer to anything, and then we have various kinds of semantics, uh, all the, those kinds of systems were motivated uh, metaphysically uh, by this, uh, this kind of minimum level of assumptions or of metaphysical presuppositions. A more modest logic, I guess, is better off than a logic which is very daring and which has too many assumptions. Uh, if you ask now, what are the limitations? What do you have in mind? So you, you feel that uh, it is very bold because it is unlimited in some sort. What, what is the, the I, I don't know, the uh, content of your question? when we say that it is very, very liberal and uh, there, is the, there are no limitations on it. Oh, all right, uh, can I intervene a bit? Yeah. All right, so uh, I also plan to follow up on this since you, the, you mentioned uh, metaphysical and ontological presuppositions. Uh, it is actually about, all right, every logic implies uh, sort of metaphysics or ontology specific to whoever conceives it. Uh, but I was wondering, is there a possibility to conceive a logic without any metaphysics or maybe, well, there are many conceivable logics. I don't know, more, one more complex than another, uh, but we cannot, uh, 
keep up with this because we cannot conceive a proportional or something like this metaphysics to match it. And it's possible to have higher and higher order logics without any conceivable metaphysics or representations that we may make up for those logics. Is this acceptable? Is this viable or not? So, uh, uh, in these terms, I'm talking about limitations. Yeah, yeah, okay, I got it now. My own position with regard to that is that there is no metaphysically free logic. Even in the most liberal logics, you are going to have a modicum of metaphysical assumptions. So if you go back to first order logic, you have the metaphysical assumptions that are related to set theory. Because when you give the semantics for first order logic, you build that semantics in terms of set theory and set theoretical notions. So there's no such a thing as a free lunch, as it were, in logic. You have to buy into some assumptions which are ontological or metaphysical. But that being said, you have to ponder how many assumptions and if there are assumptions, how um, uh, important are those assumptions for your metaphysics if you want to, uh, to, to stick to them into your metaphysics and uh, not uh, into your logics or something of that matter. So and this each... is why I'm saying that the... Uh... Yeah, go on, go on. Uh, so each, let's say, okay, the classical principles of logic. Uh, Leibniz excluded, of course. <laughs> uh, each of them has a ontological metaphysical presupposition or it's enough only a, let's say, physical, not yeah. metaphysical. No, no, I would go even further, metaphysical. Metaphysical and ontological presuppositions for the logical- Well, Leibniz is the one who went far farther. Okay. Well, I would say in the case of the classical principles based on my studies on classical antiquity, phys physical presuppositions should be enough. But uh, Leibniz goes farther. So I guess Leibniz is the one who introduces. But look, I mean, in, in terms of uh, ancient uh, thinking, look back at Aristotle, okay? The yeah. founding father of logic, as we know it now, as we have it now. So there's plenty of ontological presuppositions, Aristotelian meta metaphysical presuppositions in his logical system. Yeah. So he incorporates yes. uh, his uh, teachings from the categories, from uh, perihermeneas, all that stuff, which is not purely formal, is incorporated into his logistic theory. But usually that's observable. Even the fact that he not... That's observable at uh, yeah, on, a commonsensical point. For instance, the principle of non-contradiction, something it's like that or not. It's uh, based on the simple observation, something moves or not. So it's like physical, not really metaphysical. Yeah, when, when it comes to being and uh, to properties of the being, then uh, you go, a bit farther than physics. We should incorporate yeah. a bit of metaphysics. The substance okay, we, 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 of the substance, yeah. properties of the substance, relations, that's more than physics. Well, actually, because I was, I, I was things, asking about the, the upper limits. Not... The of the yeah. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, are there any questions? If not, oh, may I? Ask one. Uh, so my question is rather, yeah, sure, Paul. Yeah. Rather about some metaphysical view. I don't, I don't think that um, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about a paper I I read those days. Uh, it's about an Emmy Thomason one, um, an older one, 2003, I I think. Um, and she presents a metaphysical view. I don't think her metaphysical view is compatible with the free logics. But correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, she says something like that. There are some cases in which uh, 
fictional names do refer. Uh, and I think uh, this view may explain Dan's intuitions about the fact that uh, we can also say that Sherlock Holmes does not exist and that Sherlock Holmes in fiction is a detec detective. And she says that when we uh, use this prefix in fiction, um, those names do really refer to some abstract uh, artifacts. And when we use them outside the fiction, they in fact do not refer. What do you think about this perspective? Well, in order to clarify the issue, you have to clarify at a more fundamental level, what kind of predicate is the predicate of existence? What uh, does it mean for you that uh, that entity uh, to which presumably Sherlock Holmes, the name Sherlock Holmes refers, exists? If you take existence as a first order predicate, the way the prelogicians are taking existence, then it is very likely that, that you are not entitled to say that Sherlock Holmes exists in the very same way in which you say Paula Tony exists. Because you exist as an individual, okay? You have an ID, you have uh, parents, uh, and so on and so forth. So is this kind of fundamental reality, okay, of existence? But uh, then again, if you have some more sophisticated views about existence, as I mentioned at some point in my presentation, the Frege style approach to existence, in which existence is not a first order predicate, but it is a condition that we impose on the concepts. If the concepts uh, are instantiable or have some instances, okay, they could apply truly to something, then we say that uh, the predicate of existence is satisfied, but is a second order, is a higher order predicate. So you may say that Sherlock Holmes exists is true. You can argue for that, provided existence for you is a higher order predicate, because you want to say that there was someone, Arthur Conan Doyle, who wrote a book and he came up with this kind of fiction and he provided some stories about this uh, fictional character and so on and so forth. And then you can come up with a story about existence in which existence could be used in that context. But the way we are using in free logic and the way actually Sainsbury meant to use existence is the free logician's uh, meaning of the existence. So. Uh, I go with Sainsbury here saying that Sherlock Holmes exists is false. Oh, I'm sorry, but she said the same. She said that Sherlock I have another, I have same. another. Uh, so, sorry, I I'm couldn't so hear sorry. you. I, I think Amy Thompson says the same. Sherlock Holmes does not exist is true, but also it is true that in fiction, Sherlock Holmes is a detective. She accepts that both of them are true. Yeah, with that. That's not, not a contradiction there because a negative philogician is going to accept that in the fiction, Sherlock Holmes is a detective is a true sentence. But in, in the fiction, you okay. can find in the fiction, you can read that sentence, you can understand, you can translate into Romanian that English sentence, which says that Sherlock Holmes exists. So if you have several languages in which you have several sentences having the same content, then even the proposition that Sherlock Holmes exists in the, in the, in the fiction. Okay. <clears throat> uh, I have another reason to, to go with that kind of explanation. So as I said before, in first order logic, everything exists is a logical truth. You can give a counter example to that. You can say that there is something which does not exist because that means that there is something such that that's something there's not, that, that there is not such a thing as um, there is something which does not exist. So if you want to stick to that, if you want to uh, keep that validity into your logic, then you may come up with another distinction. You can say that everything exists, but not everything is real. So in the sense that reality is another operator, maybe another intentional operator, which is more fundamental for us than the operator of existence, because existence could be a purely logical predicate, which applies to everything, to Sherlock Holmes, to Julius Caesar, to Donald Trump, to Paula, Tommy, and to Sherlock Holmes, okay? Existence, but reality doesn't apply to uh, Sherlock Holmes. It applies to Donald Trump and to Paula, Tommy. So everything exists, logically speaking, but not everything is real. And in order to understand and to know what is real and what's not real, you need knowledge, not only logic. 
you need science, you need experience, you need true and real knowledge. As far as I know, I think Thomason um, accepts this view, but she, uh, so she's a creationist about metaphysics, so she accepts that everything exists. But I don't think she used the real, the real predicate, she rather used concrete and abstract predicate. So everything exists, some objects are concrete and others are even, even though, even, even though what I'm saying is not exactly what he, he finds yeah. endorsing, you may take a look at his uh, work on uh, on existence and on quantifiers and realism, and you'll see that he makes the very same, dis same distinction between reality as a fundamental operator. Uh, and he actually spells out existence in terms of fundamentality, and reality in terms of fundamentality and uh, the quantifiers. We have this dogma from Frege on that uh, existence is expressed by the existential quantifier. You know, Quine's dictum, to be is to be the value of a bound variable. So actually that is the Fregean thought that existence is expressed by existential quantifier. So if you give that to the logicians that everything exists, because otherwise you contradict yourself to say that, that there is something which does not exist, then uh, you may have, you have, maybe you are supposed to, to make that distinction between pure existence and, uh, and reality. Thank you. Or if you like, logical existence and real existence. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Uh, are there any questions left? Thank you for the question. If not, thank you again for your presentation, Professor Dumitru. And we have you. in the chat to, oh yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, and thank you all for joining. Yeah, no question in the chat. There are only two. Yeah. yeah. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.